Howdy ho there fellow sojourners and welcome back to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode we look at how representation matters in Dragon Age the Veil Guard. I'm Pastor Shane and I'll be your unauthorized moderator today as we appropriate some culture. So Dragon Age is a game, The Veil Guard is the next installment in the series, and it's a game with all the usual fantasy tropes. Dragons, and elves, and magic, and dwarves, and surgical scars from trans surgery. As was highlighted by the character creation demonstration. But he, him, she, her, and they, them, and then your gender is man, woman, non-binary. Love that. Love the inclusivity. Top surgery scars are also included in this for all of our trans and non-binary rooks out there. I absolutely was blown away by this. Um, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see the inclusion in the game and to see yourself represented. Okay, so you can play as an elf with top surgery scars. That's a little odd. If it's all about representation, seeing yourself in the game, scars and all, well, there's a little problem with that because you're not an elf. No one playing is an elf because elves do not exist you're not designing a character that looks like you if you're starting out with a species that is not you. But if it's all about fantasy, right, pretending to be something that you're not, then why would somebody who wants to be a man, who identifies as a man, who fantasizes about being a man, include the scarring that undermines that claim? In their wildest fantasies, they would be a male elf with chest surgery scars? Okay. This has produced some eye rolling and people in the gaming community have criticized this as woke nonsense, some going so far as to label it as quote, gay and retarded, to which the original series creator pushed back saying, hey, we've always been that. This from Game Rant. Dragon Age series creator David Gator has recently opted to respond to some of these complaints by remarking how the usual suspects are upset at how woke the new Dragon Age is and apparent sudden and unexpected development in the series. Following up on that train of thought, the industry veteran called the people who spread the sentiment effing tourists in a recent Blue Sky post. The label was meant to imply that these critics are falsely presenting themselves as Dragon Age fans who would know that the series could have been categorized as woke from its very first entry which hit the market back in 2009. The Dragon Age series has always been fairly inclusive. It started out before the word woke was even part of the widespread English vernacular and long before it was adopted as a sarcastic pejorative for anything perceived as progressive, such as LGBTQ and multiracial representation in the media. This could help explain why the first three mainline installments weren't as polarizing as they debuted at a time when widespread online culture wars of this sort were not as prevalent. Yeah, it's a fair statement that the Dragon Age games were pretty LGBTQ friendly, but I think what we're now seeing is that people are getting tired of a particular ideology being foisted upon them and they're starting to say enough. Normies are tired of it, they're done with it, and enough is enough. They're starting to vocalize that and voting with their wallets. On the flip side, the proponents are downplaying it, saying it's, it's just a character option. If you don't like it, don't use that feature. What's the big deal? Fair. But the creators of the game seem to think it's a really big deal. That's why they highlighted the feature. The director of the game, seen here, seems to think it's a big deal. Gee, I wonder why. And he said, quote, As a queer trans woman, I have a perspective on the games that not everyone has. Dragon Age has long been a place where LGBTQIA plus folks can see people like themselves represented respectfully. It's inherently very queer, and it's such a rare thing for marginalized communities to have representation where we feel proud and powerful in how we are depicted. He added, It's so deeply meaningful for so many. I often get emotional when I think about what it would have meant for a younger version of myself to see someone like her in a game, and as a hero no less. I hope we can be a safe place for our queer players to know they are not alone, that they are brilliant and worthy, that they are not only welcome, but celebrated. So it's really important to him. But if it's culturally significant and culturally important, then it should be pretty obvious why some people might be against it. Representation of this sort, inclusion of this sort, is meant to change the culture. That's the whole point. That's why they think it's so great. It is meant to normalize what is not normal. But whether that's a noble endeavor depends entirely on what it is you're normalizing. 
From a Christian perspective, obviously, the transgender movement is fundamentally abhorrent, but even those outside of Christendom are beginning to wake up and see the deleterious effects of the transgender mind virus and are starting to really question the wisdom of promulgating it. And people are increasingly aware that representation matters in only some cases. For instance, a mod for a character in God of War Ragnarok that changed Angraboda from black to white was removed from Nexus mods in less than an hour on the site. Which is weird, because changing the skin color of characters from white to black is totally fine on Nexus mods. But that's different. You're whitewashing when you change the skin color of a character from Norse mythology to white. Norse mythology. Norse. If there's one thing I know about Scandinavia, it's that they are a very diverse non-white people and have historically always been that. So stop whitewashing. Be historically accurate, like Assassin's Creed Shadows set in feudal Japan featuring a black samurai. As someone who grew up in Japan, here's a decent breakdown of the issue. Now, I'm no historical expert here, but I'm pretty sure that a gentleman like this would be a bit out of place in 16th century Japan, which wasn't exactly known for being a multicultural melting pot, if you catch my drift. Gamers were quick to pick up on this as well, only for Ubisoft to argue back that their main man was based on the real-life historical figure of Yasuke, a black man who came to Japan with Jesuit missionaries before serving under Lord Odu Nobunaga, and was eventually granted the honorary rank of samurai. We won't I won't mention the fact that he was only taken in by Nobunaga as a kind of travelling curiosity, that he never fought a single battle or duel, spoke very little Japanese, only served under the man for less than a year, and that he was given back to the Jesuit priests and disappeared from historical records after Nobunaga was killed. But sure, I guess one fragmented and misinterpreted historical example is good enough for Ubisoft to turn him into a superhuman ninja assassin and give him his own game. And anyone who questioned that state of affairs was clearly nothing but a racist bigot who needed to do better. Now that's fine when it comes to casually dismissing the criticisms of Western gamers, because clearly their opinions don't matter, but the one thing that Ubisoft hadn't counted on was the Japanese reaction. See, it turns out that Japanese people are pretty protective of their history and cultural heritage, as they should be, and if there's one thing that's guaranteed to piss them off, it's some foreign game studio appropriating and completely butchering their history and culture to push a political agenda that means absolutely nothing to them. Truly, the message had finally found its nemesis. Before you knew it, Japanese gamers were completely up in arms, and what had started out as a minor controversy over here in the West quickly exploded into a full-scale backlash. The question of this game was even raised in the Japanese parliament, it was that bad. And Ubisoft's bold claims about respecting Japanese culture and history soon started to fall apart under any kind of scrutiny, as Japanese gamers and historical experts began finding all kinds of mistakes and inaccuracies, like Chinese architecture in Japanese cities, flags and banners that never actually existed in real life, the baffling decision to give the game a hip-hop soundtrack, I said kill him. And perhaps worst of all, the licensed character statue of the game's female supporting character perched on top of a half-tori gate. Which is a bit unfortunate because in Japan, that's an iconic symbol of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki, so needless to say, it didn't go down too well. Okay. Anyway, the good news is people are starting to reject this stuff and the market is beginning to correct. According to IGN, Disney was super concerned with making sure that Inside Out 2 stayed away from LGBTQ themes. Quote, the apparent hesitance to touch on LGBTQ themes and storylines in particular affected Inside Out 2's development, according to several of our sources. Multiple people recall hearing about continuous notes to make Riley, the main character of both Inside Out movies, come across as less gay, leading to numerous edits that ramped up around September 2023 after the resolution of the WGA strike. Sources describe rumors that there was special care put into making the relationship between Riley and Val, a supporting character introduced in Inside Out 2, seem as platonic as possible, even requiring edits to the lighting and tone of certain scenes to remove any trace of romantic chemistry. One source describes it as just doing a lot of extra work to make sure that no one would potentially see them as not straight. 
It's worth noting that Pixar released a short in 2015 that followed Riley's first date with a boy. Still, many fans online started to call out queer coding in Inside Out 2 from the moment the first trailer arrived. Inside Out 2 spoiler to follow, the movie also teased a deep dark secret that Riley was harboring throughout, only to reveal in the post credits that the secret was that she once burned a hole in the carpet. Many fans, however, thought the reveal would be that Riley was actually grappling with her sexuality and even felt baited over what it actually was. Mind you, Riley is not canonically gay, one source says. In the film, what you saw, nothing about Riley says that she is gay, but it is kind of inferred based on certain contexts. And so that is something that they tried to play down at multiple points. Another source calls some leadership uncomfortable with queer themes at large, and the insistence on keeping those themes out of Inside Out 2 was a big thing throughout development. And why is Disney suddenly uncomfortable with queer themes? The marketing bit them. Quote, Multiple sources say that Disney leadership internally put a large part of the blame for Lightyear's financial failure on a same-sex kiss in the film, which was briefly removed, then reinstated after internal staff uproar. In a joint statement to Walt Disney Company leadership, LGBTQ workers and allies at Pixar said leadership was censoring overtly gay affection at a time where employees were also protesting the company's response to Florida's Don't Say Gay bill. It is, as far as I know, still a thing where leadership, they'll bring up Lightyear specifically and say, oh, Lightyear was a financial failure because it had a queer kiss in it, one source tells IGN. And to that I say, good. Look, it's okay that filmmakers and video game directors convey their worldview. We have freedom of speech, artistic expression is part of that speech, and if you're not supposed to write what you believe, then what the heck are you supposed to write about? But when there's only one sanctioned and approved worldview in the marketplace, it's reasonable for consumers to start to balk. Dragon Age has been gay since 2009. It's not stunning and brave anymore. It's tiresome and hackneyed. And people are getting irritated by being force-fed the same ideology over and over again, particularly when that ideology is directed at children, see Disney, and when that ideology is demonstrably harmful and detrimental to human flourishing. Let's get some fresh and better ideas in the marketplace. All right, that'll do for today. If you like what we're doing here, be sure to like, subscribe, share, tell a friend. My feature film, No Greater, is continuing its screening tours. Next stop is the Regal Edwards in Boise, Idaho on October 22nd. Details and tickets for that are available at atcfilms.com. If you want to change culture for the better, join our support team, put in your email address, and you'll get plugged in to all the latest info on our upcoming films, our mission and vision, and most importantly, how you can support. You can also follow me on the major socials and join my author's Facebook page, and I'll see you next time for more Appropriate in the Culture. Mm -hmm.